Okay, I think we'll get started. So, um, welcome everybody to plenary session number eight on uh, pinpointing FRBs. Uh, I'm Ben Steppers, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to chair this uh, interesting, exciting looking session. Um, I think we'll uh, get started straight away with no ado. And uh, the first speaker in this session is uh, Benito Marcote, who will be telling us about localizing FRBs to milliamp seconds with EVN precise. Take it away, uh, Benito. Okay, thank you, Ben. So, Benito Marcote, I would like to thank all the organizers for letting us to give this talk here. Uh, I'm Marcote, I'm working at Jive in the Netherlands. Um, this is a talk basically on behalf of the Precise and Astroflash projects, which aim to localize repeating fast reverse to the milliard second level. And here I will basically present the project and all the latest results that we've got during the lab, basically during this year. Um, but first, of course, I would like to emphasize the underlying message that Will remain in this talk, actually in this session, mainly, and our actual actual pro, uh, project, which is that the, we really need very precise localizations of fast reverse. Uh, we know that there are a lot of implications and results that can be derived from fast reverse once we have just a, num a large number of them, of these events, even if they are not localized to very precise resolution. And for many studies, we just need those statistical uh, well, studies when we have a large number. But if we really want to understand the fundamental question, which is what's the nature of fast reverse, uh, where can be originated, and which are the objects that can be related to them, we really need to know and understand where they are produced. And for that, we really need to understand the local environments and the places where we can uh, find them. And at least in a few cases, hopefully we can directly associate them with really uh, particular objects. So for that, the only way is to have a really precise localizations of them so we can really understand where uh, they are localized and trying to understand the local environment there. And actually the Fair, very first uh, localization of a uh, fast reverse was a good example of this. Uh, already back in 2017, uh, for short 12.1102, known for most of you probably, which was the first repeating fast reverse discovered. Uh, first, we localized it with the BLA, so we could obtain a precision on the level of the R second, which was enough to pinpointed and associated it to a host galaxy. However, the most important results came with the parallel or more precise localization than with the European BLBA network, because in that case, we could localize to the millisecond level, a thousand times better. And in that case, we could be sure that this particular FRB, where the position of the bars are basically shown by the crosses on the left, they were also physically associated to a persistent radio source, really compact, less than 0.7 parsecs in size, which of course we still don't understand uh, the nature of it. It can be super luminous, supernovae, massive black hole, but at least in this case, um, until basically we heard this week, it was still the only FRB with an associated persistent counterpart. We know that these objects were physically related. And thanks to this precision plus the resolution that we could achieve with the HST, we unveil a surprising environment. We noticed that the bears were coming from this particular source that was completely inside a low metallicity star forming region of a dwarf galaxy. And of course, this was an environment that no one expected before. Uh, surprisingly, this is a an environment where most of the hydrogen poor superluminous supernovae and the long jervis are produced. So that's why at that time we started thinking if FRBs can be, could be related somehow to this kind of other events. But it was the first case. And thanks to this resolution, it was the only way to be able to 
differentiate where in within the, the galaxy the FRB was located. We also localized the second repeating pass reversed, uh, firstly discovered by the time telescopes. In this case, we also observed with the European BLBI network, we detected four bursts. So we actually pinpointed the bursts to the two million second level only. And in this case, we found a completely different environment also, although uh, it was also related with a star forming region, but with different physical properties. In this case, uh, sorry. Yeah. In this case, we found a, a spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way in size. And we found that the bears uh, were basically at the edge, but outside the edge of a prominent star forming region within the galaxy. And we could only resolve this with the HST, but thanks to the precision on the bears from the EVN, we could narrow down that these bears are actually around 250 parsecs outside the star forming region. So it's also uh, different from the first case. And this had a lot of implications because they are kind of close to star forming regions. Uh, almost everyone was thinking that you can have a relatively very young sources. In this case, it can be a bit uh, older than in the first case, but we are talking about 100,000 years. But in this case, you are unable to travel from, say, the star forming region. If that's your hypothesis that it was formed, the object creating the forbids were formed inside the region. So in this case, we estimated that you need at least around one mega years to travel to that position outside the region, which already uh, turns uh, down most of the models about a single active magnetar because you didn't have time to have still an active magnetar and traveling that much at that time. But this was the two uh, Fabrice located to millisecond level until this year. Uh, since then, we've had a lot of localization with different telescopes, all of them, all the other ones on the R second level. And one thing was clear, only in the cases that the galaxy is really high and it's a really close FRB, you can narrow down with it where within the galaxy you can find the bars. So here it was clear from the two images from the bottom edges where you have a spiral galaxy discovered by ASCAP, and you have an FRB that is at least also possibly associated with the forming region. But actually, even in this case, and our second level doesn't allow you to narrow down where, or relatively to that star forming region where the bears are produced. If inside the region, outside, that could have also some important implications here. And if we go to faster bears that are much farther away, we know that basically you can associate them with the host galaxies, but you cannot say anything else about where in that galaxy or where it's the local environment in those galaxies. So it was clear that we really need to go to higher precision and having a much larger number of FRBs localized. Because we only had two, we only have a few of the other ones where you could narrow down the local environments, but nothing else. If we really need to understand which are the typical local environments, or if there are some places where are more common to find FRBs, we really need a large number of FRBs localized to million second precision. So that's why Precise was born. This is a project uh, led by Franz Christen, so Jason Hessel here that aims to localize fast reverse to the millisecond second level. So the key point of this is that we were already using the European BLB network for a few years, and we already localized two fast reverse. And we already got really important results from these two, but we really need to go to a much larger number of localizations. And the problem here is that, of course, with the EVN, we already had some limiting observing time, we still keep observing with them. But if we really want to go to a much larger number of uh, samples, we really need a much larger observing time. And that was not feasible within the European BLBA network. So what we basically did is building an ad hoc array of EVN dishes 
because we know that most of them have some available time, observing time along the year. So basically we build a customized array just based on availability at different epochs. And then we manage to observe different NFRBs during these years. So for different telescopes, the approach was a bit different. We have directors approval time. Some of the few telescopes uh, require some dedicated proposals. And we still keep one to correlate the data if we detect bursts at Jive as a regular event observation. But what we manage is to observe 100,000 of hours during the last years on different FRBs. And basically, in many cases, we have an array of even up to 10 telescopes. So we are reconstructing basically the same EVN, uh, just with more or less number of stations, depending on the epochs. And we started in 2018. During the first couple of years, we didn't detect any significant bursts, actually. But during this spring, we already started getting different results and many bursts from different FROVs. So now in the second part of the talk, I will just summarize the latest results that we've got through three different FROVs. Uh, the first one hasn't been published yet. We are still working and getting a few more bursts to make a better localization. But actually, it's quite interesting to reveal which are also our limitations. So this is 2018, 11, 19, eight. Uh, we got at the beginning only one burst in one of these observations with a quite limited number of dishes. And also the burst was not detected in the whole band, only in the bottom part. And when you only have a few dishes, one millisecond burst, then the UV coverage, how you can reconstruct the sky is quite limited too. So in these cases, in a few cases, we know that we may not be able to reconstruct the couple of millisecond level uh, precision for the FRBs, but we can see the pattern. Uh, that is still allows us to narrow down it to the 100 millisecond level. So even in this case, we are already competing a bit better or at the level as ASCAP or other telescopes that are localizing FRBs. Three minutes, but this was, uh, Benito. Yeah, thanks. But this was kind of a, the worst case the scenario and we already get more bursts. So soon you will see a much better localization of this one. The second FRB, 2011-24A, was a quite revealing case that shows our, the importance of this precision localization. So this was a really active uh, FRB during this spring. And actually many uh, observatories already localized the bears, ASCAP, the VLA, and the GMRT, and FAST. And all of them localized it uh, to the R second level, as is represented here by the different circles. And at the same time, in the continuing image, uh, the VLA and the GMRT detected some persistent counterparts, which are shown here on the right by the circles. And everything was consistent basically with the size of the optical galaxy, which is shown by the dots, the gray dots here. Um, but the problem here is that with this resolution, you are unable to say where in the galaxy and if the FRB is located, uh, associated with this persistent radio emission or not. But in two observations, we detected uh, seven, 18 bursts and we could narrow down this FRB to the millisecond precision, which basically is a factor of 1,000 better than the previous ones. So we could first solve some uncertainties with the different positions that they had, and we could pinpoint within the galaxy where the FRBs were produced. Additionally, we didn't detect, as you see in the color, in the gray scale image, any persistent radio emission, which means that the emission is completely resolved out on the millisecond level, and then likely this is just a star formation from the galaxy, as happening many of the galaxies. So this is completely extended emission and unlikely associated with the FRB. And then I will take just the last two minutes to show the probably most interesting case, uh, 2001 which was an FRB uh, discovered by Chang. And with the resolution, they couldn't narrow down what was the counterpart, but they already have four different candidates. 
And the important part is this was kind of associated with M81 for sure because of the DM. So I made it the closest one to the Earth so far, a part of the galactic uh, magnetar. So we kept observing this one for different epochs. We detected basically five different bursts in three observations. As you saw from Kenzie's talk, the properties of the bursts were quite curious and really now from a few cases. But here I will just focus on the localization of it. So we detected different bursts. Uh, one of them it was too faint to do an image. And here you have the individual bursts due to UV coverage and resolution, we couldn't narrow down that well or the reconstruction of the image it still didn't allow us, allow us to pinpoint it to a, a very particular side lobe in the image plane. But when go combining all these bears, we've been able to actually narrow down to the a couple of millisecond for millisecond level, which actually this is an updated image from the uh, draft that we put in archive. So actually now we have a much better localization. And interestingly, uh, here the white circle uh, represents the a global cluster associated with M81. So it's clear that FRB is contained and relatively close to the center of this global cluster, which is also shown here with the optical images. So this is the global cluster. This is the profile, the brightness profile of the optical emission on the cluster. And we see that the FRB that is uh, shown here by the red little dot is actually probably significant. We are still working on the systematic possible uncertainties between optical and radio, but it looks like the FRB is actually a bit offset from the center of the global cluster that is represented here by the black circle. And this had a really important uh, implications because a global cluster is a really old system. You do not expect any very young magnetar inside that, at least not one produced by a, a typical core collapse. So we are basically uh, removing all the, uh, the most promising scenarios that we've been playing around with for the previous FRBs. But in here, you still have either other possibilities of formation, like accretion induced or major induced collapse. Or we know that in global clusters, you can find a relatively large population of low mass X ray binaries. So this is also one of the implications that you may have here. Uh, if we go to the continuum image, we didn't take anything here. Neither from the EVN yeah, or sorry, the. Benito, do, you, do you have much more? Because no, it's leaving, just the summary. Not leaving much time for questions. Anymore. Yeah, it's a summary. Okay, great. So we don't detect any persistent emission, neither on the EVN and VLA scales. Sorry. And this is basically the summary. This is the closest extragalactic FRB localized today in a very completely different environment. And you've already had two different scenarios on this one one from Remember on formation scenarios in global clusters. And if you are interested in properties of the FRB, you can see, you can see Nemo's talk. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Congratulations. It was a great talk. Um, do we have questions? Um, at the moment, I don't see any in the, uh, the Q&A uh, or on Slack. But uh, I have a quick, couple of quick questions while we wait for people to type. Um, how much are you affected by changes in ionospheric phase and the like between different bursts? Is that providing any limitations on your ability to combine the different epochs? Uh, between different bursts, I don't think we have, or I will say that really the major one is just the global correction that you have for the ionosphere. So you don't have enough resolution so probably that introduces a bit much larger offset because at the end we are doing phase referencing observations. So any difference there from one verse to the other, you are solving it during calibration with the scans on the calibrator that are right before and after 
the verse, which means basically one, a couple of minutes before and after. At least you, with that, you remove most of the contribution that you haven't solved for the A in or So between different epochs, we haven't seen any really critical difference as compared to different verse within the same observations. Okay, yeah, great. So I think it's more, you are more limited by the actual calibration and variability on the, yeah, minute, so many the scales. But no, maybe not just because I know her, or at least we haven't been able to trace that detail. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, uh, thanks Benito. Um, given the time, uh, I think we'll um, we'll move on to the next talk. Thanks very much again, and um, please do post post questions uh, in Slack if you have anything else you want to ask about this really great result. Um, the next speaker. This session is uh, Srihash Tendoka, who's going to tell us about uh, localization of chime FRB repeaters with VLA and real, real fast. And I think actually something's got added V, v light as well. So um, take it away, uh, Srihash. All right. Uh, thank you, Ben. I'd like to thank the organizers for you know preparing this beautiful conference in the time of pandemic and having me giving me an opportunity to uh, speak here. I'm going to tell you about uh, our campaign to localize Chime FRB repeaters with the Jansky VLA. So this is this talk is in, is on the behalf of the Chime FRB Real Fast as well as the VLight Fast collaborations. So Benito has already told you told us about why we need precise localization. So I won't belabor this point, but I do want to show what, what it looks like for an optical astronomer. Chime FRB's localization is order of 10 to 30 arc minutes. If you uh, go straight from the metadata of the FRB, and there are a lot of galaxies in that region. In this uh, image on the right hand side, I'm showing you uh, a ke deep Keck image of the first FRB that was the first repeating FRB that was discovered, FRB 121102. And this red circle is a three arc minute error region for uh, taken from the Arecibo. Okay, this is 10 times smaller than what Chime localizes. And there are hundreds of galaxies in that region. And I'm betting that none of us, even the original localizers of this FRB can point out to me the galaxy on this image. You have to really zoom in to a tiny corner and then figure out that this galaxy, the FRB actually comes from this tiny little speck of light right here. So this is just to emphasize how hard it is to identify uh, host galaxies of FRBs. And in this particular case, because it was a dwarf galaxy, which are prolific in the universe, it is really hard. Once you get a, a, a host galaxy, of course, you get the redshift, you get energetics, you, get, you can try to understand the environment, the star formation rate, metallicity, that gives you a lot more information about FRBs and where they originate. To drive home this point, let me point out that for a few low DM FRBs, we can identify the host galaxy itself with arc minute localization. The case in point are, uh, is this excellent work by uh, Mohit Bharadwaj, for example, where we are able to localize, uh, we are able to identify this FRB 2020, uh, 2020-01-20E with, uh, as it is coming from the outsides of uh, M81, but that just means that it is a cool repeater. It's a nearby repeater. That's nice. But when you do an arc second sub arc second localization as um, Benito pointed out. You start realizing the science implications of it. You start asking why why in the world is this FRB in a globular cluster? So the sub arc second localization is critical for understanding the local environment. You might find that an FRB is in a star forming galaxy, but it might not be in a star forming region in that galaxy. So it might be a completely different source. With that in mind, we had to start localizing Chime FRB repeaters and Chime intrinsically cannot localize to sub arc second precision. So we have started using other interferometers like the VLA to localize uh, FRBs. And the VLA has two different backend commensal observing systems which search for transients. So the real fast system developed by KC Law, uh, Paul Demarest and their collaborators works with uh, the high frequency bands of the VLA and it searches five to 10 millisecond sampled visibilities and it images them uh, after dispersion to search for transients. There is also another system called the V-Light, which is the VLA uh, low-frequency ionospheric 
uh, experiment, which is built by Tracy Clark, uh, Namir Kasim, and their collaborators, which observes from 230 to 500 megahertz. This is a low frequency system, which has a completely separate signal processing uh, pipeline compared to the regular uh, VLA correlator. And the VLight fast backend on this system searches for transients in real time. Now, both of these systems commensally give you deep imaging as well. So you can observe the same patch of the sky, search for transients, and get uh, deep images at different frequencies and different uh, angular resolutions. Now, the idea is that these interferometers have a limited field of view. So their, the FRB detection rate for a blind search is fairly low. And Chime obviously is detecting a lot of FRB repeaters. So we should be able to try to target Chime FRB repeater fields and then localize these repeaters. And uh, as it so happens, the primary beam of the VLA is fairly well matched to the Chime FRB localization precision. So here I'm showing you the 32 arc minute uh, full width at half power uh, beam of the VLA, which is well matched with the Chime FRB header localization, the main lobe of it. There are some side lobes in some cases where uh, Chime is unable to distinguish between the main lobe and the side lobe localization, but those can be eliminated through Chime FRB baseband data and intensity data, uh, which improves the precision, localization precision to about 10 to 20 arc minutes. So the game plan uh, for us has been to use the VLA to observe Chime FRB repeater fields. We have been doing this since uh, 28, uh, the end uh, second half of 2018, and we have observed for almost 180 uh, triggered hours and 100 hours of quote unquote filler time. I'll tell you what uh, what those are. There are two observing strategies. One is to have triggered observations, which is based on the idea that we see temporal clustering of uh, FRB. So FRBs have these activity periods, which seem to be order of a week, but that's only for the repeaters that we do know of. So we have seen, for example, uh, FRB 2011-24, where there was a huge period of there was a period of huge activity where all of these uh, localizations were done, and before that and after that, there has been absolutely nothing. And then there are filler observations which we implemented because uh, we need to hedge against the ignorance of uh, this kind of clustering. Maybe FRBs don't cluster. Maybe FRBs cluster at different frequencies. So. We also need to hedge against uh, that bias. So our triggered observation procedure is fairly simple. We have a list of known repeaters, and then we wait for a Chime FRB detection, which operates between 400 to 800 megahertz. And once a detection is done, we trigger the VLA to observe about five to seven times with two hour long observations. And then uh, we just stop and wait for the next trigger. These observations are spread out, spread out over a week or so. Uh, because that is the typical time scale we have been seeing from uh, other repeaters. This, of course, assumes that the activity at 400 to 800 megahertz implies uh, activity at 1.4 gigahertz or uh, slightly higher, which we might be using for uh, the VLA observations. Now, this is uh, reasonably true for uh, repeaters like FRB 180916, FRB 201124, uh, where we have localized. Uh, uh, we have detected uh, bursts in L band right after chime, chime observations. But we don't know whether this is really true for any other observation. So one of the things that keeps me up at night is what if this activity at 400 to 800 megahertz doesn't reflect activity at 1.4 gigahertz? Uh, for example, the first repeating FRB, FRB 121102, is prolific at 1.4 gigahertz. But Chime has observed exactly one burst from it. It is not even a repeater at Chime. So there could be some Chime repeaters which might not emit at 1.4 gigahertz, or you know, they might emit at completely different times. Uh, there could be, you know, for FRB 18916, the periodic repeater, we know that high frequency observations, high frequency bursts come later in the uh, activity window, whereas uh, low frequency bursts come earlier. But what if this trend is reversed? We will never be able to trigger uh, VLA observations based on Chime and then have success. So we use this idea of filler observations, which are short observing blocks, which are used to fill holes in uh, the VLA schedule. We schedule, uh, we make scheduling blocks of 30, minute, 30 minutes to one hour. 
and we put them into the VLA queue, but there is no guarantee that these will be observed. These will be executed and they have the lowest scheduling probability. So give, if we are granted 100 hours by the time allocation committee, we would actually you know, get observations for about 50 to 60 hours or maybe even less. But despite that, despite having only you know, observed about 300 hours over the past uh, three years, we have had quite a bit of success. Uh, we have deep observations of 13 active repeater fields in a mixture of A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D configs uh, for the VLA, which have different angular resolution. So we can figure out whether a particular radio source is resolved or not. We have not yet uh, detected or identified rather a persistent radio source in any of the localized FRBs yet, but we have detected FRBs. There's uh, one FRB uh, which was uh, which was detected as a serendipitous FRB in uh, one of the repeater fields. Uh, we have detected and localized FRB 180916, which is the uh, periodic FRB. We have also localized FRB uh, 2011 24, which I'll talk about a little bit. And last year, it showed some very interesting results from FRB 2011 30, which we have localized, and we are still trying to uh, understand what what this. Uh, what the environment is telling us. So I'll talk, tell about some unpublished work uh, in there. So the serendipitous FRB was discovered uh, in while, uh, while we were observing this field for FRB 20, uh, 2018-0814, which is R2, which is a low DM uh, FRB with a uh, DM of about 189 parsec per cubic centimeter. And we found this FRB, uh, which had a DM of 960 parsec per cubic centimeter, which is one of the highest uh, uh, DMs for a localized FRB. Uh, this, you, as you can see at the bottom, uh, this FRB was localized next to two fairly faint galaxies. And you can see different images in V band, R band, and I band, which is uh, lower, shorter wavelength to longer wavelength for uh, non optical astronomers. And there are the two galaxies. Uh, are, have different colors. So the so galaxy B is brighter in the blue, and galaxy A is brighter in the red wavelengths. And they're they're late type galaxies, so they are uh, they have an older population, and they don't have any emission line. So it is very hard to do spectroscopy on these, and we are not able to get a spectroscopic redshift at all. So we, all we have is an estimate of uh, the photometric redshift, which turns out to be about 0.6, which places this at as one of the farthest FRBs that we have detected and localized. Now, this really highlights the challenge of uh, identifying the hosts for high redshift galaxies. We want to go to redshift three uh, galaxies, but if FRBs are going to be localized outside of faint uh, non-star forming galaxies where we don't get any emission lines, our, our work is going to be really, really hard. The other FRB that we uh, localized was FRB 2011-24, which was quite hyperactive uh, in uh, Chime. And so once we had Chime detections, we triggered the VLA to get a very precise localization. Uh, there is a slight uh, offset from uh, the ASCAP localization, which was later confirmed by GMRT as well as EVN, as Benito showed. Now, this FRB comes from a, an extremely massive galaxy. So this galaxy has, uh, this is, the most massive massive repeater host compared to any other uh, repeater and it has the persistent radio emission from this uh, galaxy turns out to be consistent with whatever star formation is occurring in there there is about two solar masses of uh, two solar masses per year of star formation which is happening and there is no point like persistent radio source uh, unlike what we have seen in frb 12 11 02 and uh, the new FRB that Shivani Bhandari and her co colleagues have localized. Now, coming to the unpublished image, this is a FRB which we localized earlier uh, in February. This is an unpublished time repeater, and the details of this uh, repeater will uh, will be published soon. And you should see three, three minutes, you do this. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So this is a nearby FRB with a DM excess of about 210 parsec per cubic centimeter, and which means that it's the maximum redshift that it could be at is about 0.2. And you can see that uh, this FRB was localized with a precision of about 
one arc second because this was localized to the DLA VLA D configuration, which is the most compact configuration with the uh, with the shortest baseline. So the precision the precision is not as high as it could have been with the A configuration or one of the bigger configurations. At the same time, there was no uh, detection in V light fast at low frequency. So there's a uh, 1.4 gigahertz detection, but nothing at lower frequencies. And interestingly, there was also a rapid X-ray follow-up thanks to the Swift Guano team, where Swift XRT slew to this location within 40 minutes of uh, the burst detection, and uh, we didn't see anything. But it is an interesting uh, uh, limit which we can put on afterglows. Now this FRB was detected on 6th of February, but uh, and we got some imaging of uh, the field. But after that, it has we have had a few weeks of bad weather. And then this FRB went behind the sun constraint till 2nd of August, which is yesterday. And we have not been able to do good spectroscopy of this field. So I, I have been citing Murphy's law at this point because it just seems to be affecting us in all possible ways. Now, these are this is a deep image from Megacam uh, on the CFHT of this source. The, the dashed circle shows you a one half second, one sigma uh, error region around the FRB location. And there are a bunch of sources which I've localized. You can see it's a fairly complex and crowded field. Now, these two are clearly extended. Source one is also slightly extended. And I can tell you a little bit more about these sources. We got spectroscopy for source four and five. It turns out that they are elliptical galaxies with, spe with a spectroscopic redshift of 0.52. So they're clearly background galaxies. And they're extremely bright. Their uh, absolute magnitudes are about minus 22 in our band. Source two is a point like foreground star. And source one is extended. It's possibly a dwarf galaxy. And it has uh, an apparent magnitude of about 23.5. And we are trying to undertake the, the spectroscopy of source one, two, and three uh, as we speak. And hopefully, once we get good weather and low air mass, we'll be able to update everybody on it. Now, if you use the uh, path inferences, you can try to figure out, assign uh, posterior probabilities that this FRB is associated with one of these sources. And if you take all the non-point like sources in a 30 arc second uh, radius, it turns out that source one is basically the only candidate which could be the host. Now, assuming that uh, source one is at about a redshift of about 0.2, it has an absolute magnitude of minus 17, uh, minus 17, which means it is a dwarf galaxy very much like FRB 12.11.02. But this, this FRB has a separation of about seven kiloparsec from the center of this galaxy. It is not uh, on the star forming region as was the case for you know, FRB 12.11.02, FRB 18.09.16 and any of the other very well localized uh, repeaters. The deep radio imaging of this uh, location also reveals no uh, radio source with a limit of about two times 10 to the 37 hertz per second. So this is a very unusual location. There is literally no star formation or any significant stellar population at that location, um, which is what is confounding us right now. The caveat, of course, is that if there were uh, uh, globular clusters like the one in M81, we would not see it. But this is a dwarf galaxy, so you know the probability of having a having globular clusters becomes equal, equivalently lower. So to summarize, uh, finding. Chime, uh, Chime FRB repeaters with the VLA requires has taken a, has required us uh, a lot of patience and time from us. Our early efforts were not very successful, but now we do have a lot of results, and we have we are trying to better understand FRB behavior so that we can follow up these repeaters uh, more effectively. And of course, we have more uh, we have interesting science results in the pipeline. So do stay tuned, and we shall uh, publish shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Srihash. Excellent talk. Um, okay, so we have one question from, from Sonda. Sonda Tavain is saying, in 1809-16b, we first see L-band, then Chime, then LOFA. Uh, apparently, you claimed in your talk that high frequency arrives later for the source, which is needed for VLA follow-up. Oh, I, did I claim that? Okay, maybe I got, got it wrong, uh, got it backwards, but yeah. I, it, it could be the other way around, and I, I worry about that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I was wondering myself, 
how how do you feel about the sustainability of the required observing time for these these uh, follow ups in this manner? I mean, I, I'm guessing, you know, I know there's a talk later in this session which is perhaps trying to address that issue, but. Uh, yeah, I, uh, so both in terms of radio and optical, I think we need to find more sustainable solutions. I don't think uh, this is going to be uh, this is going to be a sustainable thing. We cannot, you know, ask for hundreds of hours of VLA time for uh, a few a handful of FRBs. So efforts like ASCAP and Chime Outriggers and uh, Atmos 2D are going to be extremely important for continuing this program. I don't think we can uh, do that. On the optical side, we need to learn from extra galactic astronomers as to how to efficiently observe and uh, identify host galaxies. And that is something we continue to do. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Srihash. And uh, we'll, um, well, we've run out of time for questions. I'll pop it, post the other question in the, in the Slack for you. Uh, OK. Great, we'll move on to the uh, the next speaker. Uh, that is uh, Laura Dreesen, and she will be telling us about the first sub arc second localized FRBs with, uh, with Meerkat. Uh, thanks for that, Ben. Um, so as Ben said, I'm gonna be talking about our localized FRBs with Meerkat. So the work that I'm presenting today is a collaboration um, mainly between Meertrap and Thundercat. Um, as well as a couple of others, which I'll mention later. Mir Trap is the more transients and pulsars group led by Ben at the University of Manchester. Um, and we're a fully commensal project, uh, observing commensally with the Meerkat large survey projects and a few other things. Thundercat, which is also an acronym, but I always forget it because it's really long, um, is the Meerkat Large Survey Project investigating and searching for um, variable and transient sources with Meerkat. So they focus a lot on X-ray binaries, cataclysmic variables, that sort of thing, and following up those sources, um, but also has a commensal aspect uh, searching other LSP Large Survey Project um, images and their own images as well. So the first FRB I'm going to talk about has the great name FRB6, that's not its official name, um, and this work is in preparation. So uh, the key observations for this are Thundercat observations of the low mass X-ray binary GX339-4. So we're really looking in the galactic plane, we're just four degrees away. These observations up until the imaging step are processed by Lilia Tremu um, because she is the Thundercat lead for GX339 itself. Um, the field has been observed weekly since September 2018 and Thundercat has committed to observing the field weekly for the full five years that the LSP is running. Each weekly observation is 10 to 15 minutes uh, with a minimum integration time of eight seconds. So that's the shortest image that we can make. And Meertrap started observing commensally with this, uh, with, the, with Thundercat observations in general in this field from September 2020. And you can see a nice image of the field in the background. It has lots of point sources, which is always good. So FRB6 was detected on the 5th of April this year uh, during Thundercat observations of GX339-4. You can see its stats here. Um, its uh, DM excess is 200 units. Um, and you can see that we've got a nice little bit of scattering there as well. It has really nice signal to noise, so that's a good sign that we'll be able to see it in the images. So what I then did is take that 10 minute um, observation, the image imaging that's been processed by Lilia, and I made 73 eight second slices so that covers the whole um, epoch. And then I processed all of those images using the LOFAR trap. So this is a, a pipeline for um, processing a time series of radio images. And then it extracts light curves and some variability parameters. So here I show those variability parameters against um, flux density. So that's the median flux of the light curves for all of the um, unresolved sources in the field. So I've manually removed the resolved sources because they cause a bit of a problem for me. Um, 
This is the eta parameter, so that's based on the reduced chi-squared, where you assume that every source is constant and then calculate the reduced chi-squared. So if, you, if a source is not constant, it should be an outlier. The V parameter is the modulation parameter, so that's the standard deviation of the light curve divided by the mean. And the chi parameter is a parameter that I uh, created myself for using the median absolute deviation. So that's uh, specifically designed to find single epoch outliers or sources that sort of burst every now and then. And we can see in all of these plots that we have two outliers. These are the same source in each of these plots. Um, so what's this one, this outlier? Um, this is sort of our, our serendipitous test source in, in all of these DX339 searches for variables, um, the mode changing pulsar. Um, so in eight seconds or 10 minutes, um, it varies in flux density so that create some interesting variability. So we know what this source is um, and we can rule that one out as our FRB. But we have one other outlier um, and the light curve of this source looks like this. So this is really great. Um, this eight second slice was also the eight second slice that we detected the FRB with mere trap. So this ticks sort of ticks all the boxes. So we have a, a single interesting outlier that has one um, eight second slice that it's bright it's the correct eight second slice. Um, and yeah, it's the only it's the only outlier apart from the pulsar. So that's all really good signs. We've found our FRB. Before I show the images and go into the localization, um, I had to check the absolute astrometry of the images that we have. So there are five unresolved ATPMN ATCA sources in the field of view. And the ATPMN survey has a medium, median absolute astrometric uncertainty of of 0.4 arc seconds in RA and DEC. So I extracted the RA and DEC from all of the sources in the 10 minute image, the Meerkat 10 minute image, and compared the, uh, the ATPMN and Meerkat positions of those five um, sort of reference sources. And you can see the separation here in arc seconds between the Meerkat and ATPMN positions. So it's not perfect, not too bad. So to improve this, I, um, oh, but first these are the sources, so you can see they're nice and unresolved and bright. Um, and to improve the, the positions and, and get them a bit closer to the ATPMN positions, um, I solved for an affine transformation matrix and apply that to um, all of the positions of all of the sources in both the eight second images and the 10 minute image. So because I solved for the affine transformation matrix, um, in the 10 minute image, I wanted to double check that that still applies in our eight second image. So I compared um, bright sources brighter than a Jansky in the eight second and 10 minute images, and they have a median separation of 0.2. So that's within our 0.4 arc second um, uh, absolute astrometric, astrometric uncertainty. And you can see here, this is the separation before applying the transformation to the Meerkat images and the separation after between the reference sources. So we've improved a lot and we've got that 0.4, which is what we wanted. So we have this source, what does it look like? Um, so this is the off pulse eight seconds before the FRB and this is the FRB itself. So uh, it's a nice unresolved source. It appears and then disappears. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So I extracted the position from the eight second uncorrected um, image using Pi BDSF. And that has uncertainties of 0.1 and 0.2, courtesy of the nice bright signal to noise, even in an eight second image. So we don't have any DM correction. Um, and then I added in quadrature the 0.4 arc second uncertainty um, from the ATPMN uh, astrometry. So that means our corrected position for this FRB has uncertainties of 0.4 and 0.5 arc seconds in RA and DEC, which is really exciting. Because um, Thundercat has observed this field a lot, uh, we also have a three hour combined image of the field. So that's from combining a few weeks of 10 minute observations, uh, which you can see here on the right. So this is the FRB detection eight second image on the left and uh, the deeper image on the right. And you can see that there's a really faint extended radio source about eight, seven, eight arc seconds away from the position of the FRB. So faint extended resolved radio source, uh, hints towards a galaxy. So what does this look like in the optical? So this is a stacked 
uh, deck caps um, image in the optical, the red numbers are the Gaia distances of those point sources. Um, and you can see this cyan circle here is the position of the FRB and the yellow circle is the position of that extended radio source. So you can see that the FRB is on top of this nice optical point source. Uh, just based off the distance, that source would have half the DM of the FRB. Um, but we also did take a spectrum, an optical spectrum of that source and it's A star. So it's highly unlikely that the FRB is coming from a star that's a bit too close by. However, this extended optical source um, looks also like a galaxy and it's on top of our resolved radio source. Um, we're awaiting a, a salt spectrum of this faint optical source. And it's important to note here as well that we are looking through the galaxy, so the extinction is quite high. So we expect this optical source actually goes out much further, um, but we don't get that faint emission due to extinction in this direction. So we have a localized FRB and we have a pretty good candidate for the host um, of this FRB. I mentioned that we have been observing the Thundercat field since 2018, but we only started uh, observing commensally with Mir Trap in September last year. Um, I have been imaging all of those 10 minute images to eight second um, slices, which takes a really long time. So I, in my, uh, the computers that are running it have not finished, but so far we have over 6,000 eight second images and I've um, run those through the trap as well um, and haven't found any other bursts for FRB6. Um, so, so far no repeats, but we're still observing commensally with Thundercat and they're observing it every week. So we have plenty of chances to see if it does. So we've localized an FRB to, uh, better than arc second precision, and uh, we have a likely uh, host for it, but so far no repeats. Um, a little as a little bit of a bonus, I have two more sources for you. So let's talk about FRB seven, um, which you can tell I got a bit, bit excited about my stamp font, so I, I put it here as well. This is preliminary, um, so still a bit of work to be done here, but this is the the sort of first results from it. Um, so this is, uh, you can see the FRB here. It's an incoherent beam only detection. Um, as Fabian mentioned in his talk in the previous session, session seven, um, we have incoherent beam and coherent beams that we search, um, but this one was an incoherent beam only. Uh, this FRB was found in collaboration with an open time proposal team led by Christo Venter. So uh, we uh, observed, Mirtrap observed as part of that. The reason that they pointed at this particular field is because there are two other known FRBs um, within one degree of where we detected this one. Um, so it's a little bit fainter than the previous FRB. And because uh, Christo's team was looking for FRBs and trying to localize them, they imaged, uh, sorry, they, they um, observed with two second time resolution in the images. So here we have the two second off and then on um, of this source. Um, it's a bit fainter and we're also working to improve the calibration and processing of the imaging, but you can see, clearly see here a source that wasn't there before. It's also the only source that goes on and off at the right time um, in these images. Because of the processing and, and the fainter, that this source is just fainter than FRB6, we have localized it to about an arc second in both RA and DEC. And in the optical, um, so this, this region has a, a radius of three arc seconds, otherwise it cuts straight through that faint source. Um, this is the, that position using the um, Goodman telescope. And you can see that there is a, a couple of optical sources nearby and a really faint one um, really close by. We don't know anything more about these sources at this point in time. And another bonus, um, FRB8, again, this is some preliminary work. Two minutes sounds right. No worries. Um, so this source with you can see here is, is really narrow and also a lot fainter than the previous two sources. Um, so unfo unfortunately we can't get the imaging localization as these are eight second images um, observed by Mongoose, another Meerkat large survey project. However, this source was detected in both the incoherent beam and some coherent beams. So that means that we can do localization using a tight array beam localization method um, by Tian 
one of my mere trap colleagues. Um, so you can see this FRB has a DM of 750 units. And this work was done as part of the F to the power of four collaboration. Um, so using the uh, tight array beam localization methods. So these are our two coherent beams, the large regions that you can see. The smallest region is the um, one sigma localization and the larger region is the two sigma localization. So even though we can't get this, this FRB in an image, we can still get pretty good localization. Um, and you can see in this Gemini image um, that I had to tweak a lot to, to get these really faint optical sources to show up. So again, we, we don't know more about these sources, but there are a couple of optical sources within the one sigma region. So in summary, um, we performed our first uh, sub arc second localization of a mere trap detected FRB um, in collaboration with the Thundercat um, LSP. And we also searched for repeat bursts because of um, past observations of the same field, but didn't find anything. We have a preliminary, pre preliminary localization of FRB7 in two second images um, with uncertainties of about an arc second. And we also have a tight array beam localization of another FRB, which gives us a few arc seconds uh, localization. And thank you to our collaborators as well. It's really exciting to work with Mia Trap as well as the other teams. Thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, uh, I will say excellent, even though it sounds like I'm biased, excellent presentation. <laughs> um, uh, so there are a few questions for you. Uh, the first is from uh, Slack from uh, Mohit, who's asking, uh, sorry if you already mentioned this in your talk, but what is the FRB6's DM access and how deep is the optical image you use for the optical association? So the DM access is 200 units for FRB6. So that puts it as, I think, a little bit less than a gigaparsec away. Um, and I think the depth is uh, about 23rd magnitude, I think, for depth caps, 22, 23. Um, so, you know, a deeper optical image would also be great, but we do suffer from extinction and just a lot of sources uh, in this area as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so Matthew had a question in the chat, but Manisha has already had, answered that one. Um, so uh, Mohit had a second question. He said, with regard to FRB7, have you plotted a one sigma uncertainty region in the optical image? For FRB7, um, I can quickly go back to that one. So this is FRB7, and yes, it's sort of here. So out to about where that, that cross ends up for the um, one arc second, one sigma localization. Okay, yeah, so that circle there is... Um, is three arc seconds, second. otherwise it's cut straight through. Yep. <laughs> Okay, um, right. I th think in, oh, sorry, I thought I saw Sri Hush was typing, in, but he's, he's not quite fast enough with the typing. So um, we'll get you to answer that question in the Slack. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Laura. Uh, so we'll move on to the next presentation, which will be given by Adam Della, <clears throat> who's gonna tell us about the utmost 2D FRB detection and localization engine. Thanks, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to get the opportunity to talk about Utmost 2D uh, today. And I'm doing this on behalf of the, the whole team, who you can see down at the bottom of the slide here. It's a, it's a big team that's been, been working very hard for the last couple of years. So a little bit about um, the Malonglo telescope, which is where uh, the Utmost facility um, uh, operates out of. Uh, it's about 50 kilometres away from Canberra, the capital city of Australia. It's over 50 years old, and it's still the largest collecting area in the Southern Hemisphere, about 35,000 square metres or so. Um, and it consists of two cylindrical reflectors um, located or laid down orthogonally to each other. So the east-west arm can steer uh, north and south, but the north-south arm is fixed. It's just a transit facility, um, and it operates at about 840 megahertz. So the east-west arm of Utmost has been operational for about five years now, and in that time it's detected uh, 18 FRBs. 
And, um, but because it's only laid out in one direction, it hasn't been able to localize them to, to galaxies, so to their host galaxies. So the almost 2D project is uh, to, to bring the north-south arm back to life so that we can use this facility to, to localize FRBs in real time when we find them. So, uh, and so this is just the, uh, the layout as seen from the top. So in the blue, that's the uh, existing arm that's uh, about 1.6 kilometers long. And in the green highlighted is the north-south arm, also about 1.6 kilometers long that we've been working on. So I just wanted to go back to basics for a second, just to, to sort of like uh, motivate uh, the, the design approach that we've taken here. Um, we want to have large fields of view so that we can see, you know, we have a good chance of finding lots of FRBs. And we do that by getting uh, small antenna elements. So in this example that I've chosen here, um, looking at a reference frequency of one gigahertz, if you take a 10 by 10 meter collecting area, you can get a two by two uh, field of view on the sky. And so if you want to add sensitivity, um, instead of making just a, the single element bigger, which would give you a smaller beam, you get more of these elements and you add them together um, to form uh, one one tide beam on the sky, and you can do that more than once. Um, and if you've got a fully filled aperture like this, then to tile out the whole primary beam, you need as many uh, beam uh, uh, sorry synthesized beams on the sky as you have antenna elements that you're adding together. But the trouble is, um, we want to be able to localize our sources to to galaxies, and to do that, we want a precision of about an arc second or better, depending on what your ultimate science game is. Um, and that means because we can't really localize to better than maybe a tenth to a hundredth of a beam, depending on how well you can calibrate, the beams themselves can't be bigger than about an arc minute and ideally more like you know, 10 arc seconds or so. And so if you look at the, the wavelengths that we're observing at, that means you need baselines of you know, one to 10 kilometers. But the number of beams that you need then is rising with the, with the baseline length squared and the computational intensity is going you know, roughly linearly with the number of beams. So that's a problem. So I've broken the scale here, but uh, if you were silly enough to try and build a, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer fully filled aperture, and you wanted to then uh, image the full two by two squared, two by two degrees that you could have if the individual elements were 10, 10 meters each, then you'd need like a million beams. And uh, you know, that's, that's probably not quite, quite feasible. And we can't afford to build like 100 square kilometers of collecting area. We're sort of struggling to do one at the moment. Um, but even if you don't fully fill that aperture, the number of beams that you need in order to, to fully sample the, the, the primary field of view doesn't change. So if you, if you only have a few, a few stations, you still need that, that million beams if you want to do them at the full resolution from the get-go. So the compromise, the, the smart way to, to, to do it is to pack a lot of your collecting area into a densely filled detector block um, and have some outlying antennas that you don't add into the sum when you're just searching. So here I'm showing a sort of square detector block where you don't need, you still need a kind of largish number of beams uh, depending on how, how big that detector block is, but uh, not a ridiculous number to, to fill the full field of view. And then when you find something, if you've saved the raw data from not just this, but also these outlying antennas, you can go back and make an image and, and localize with much higher precision to the precision that you'd like to do. Um, and the, the point that I'd like to make is that if you have a fully filled block, it doesn't matter what shape that block is, whether it's a, a square or a, or a long, long line, you still need the same number of beams to fully search out that, um, that full field of view on the sky as you have antenna elements going into it. So if you stretch, uh, take all of your antenna elements and stretch them out in a long line, like you have for, for utmost um, with, a, with this 1.6 kilometer long arm, then if you have uh, of order a few hundred primary antenna elements, then you need of order a few hundred beams to, to search out the, that full field of view. And this, the shape of the individual beams is kind of funny then, the, the kind of long skinny uh, slices uh, cutting across the main primary beam, um, but you still get the full, the full field of view back. And so then if you go and add yourself some outriggers, coincidentally in a, in a straight line here, then you can go back and uh, image with the, that uh, full resolution in both directions and be able to localize the sources. So that's what led us to, to Upmost 2D. Um, and the idea was we wanted to build this quite, quite cheaply because uh, we didn't have, a, didn't have a huge amount of money to lay out on, on new hardware. So we designed this modular, uh, what we call a cassette, 
which has uh, eight, eight feeds on it and an analog beam former and some, some low cost, low noise amplifiers. And we went out and we we're gonna plop them down on the north south arm so that we could uh, slave it to the east west arm and, uh, and uh, download voltages every time we got an FRB and localize it. But it turned out that the system was so good it was about eight times more sensitive than the system that was deployed on the east-west arm and had a larger field of view that we decided to change our approach a little bit. So this is what we had up until uh, sort of this year on the on utmost, where just the east-west arm was operating as shown in the blue there. And we had uh, of order 500 fan beams that we were um, uh, searching for FRBs. And we were going to pop down a couple of these cassettes along the north-south arm at various places. Um, so that we could localize FIBs that were found with the east-west arm. But because the, the new system was so sensitive, what we've done is we've put the, the, a, a fair number of these cassettes together in a detector block on the, on the north-south arm. And so now we have a second detector um, where the number of beams is quite small because the number of cassettes is quite small and they're in a, in a block quite close together. Um, but we have this very large field of view. And so we have this complementary dual detector system. So any FRB that we are able to detect with either arm, whether the trigger comes from the east-west arm or comes from the north-south arm, will be localizable if it falls within this little area here, this circle that's about two and a half degrees across. Um, because it will be, uh, you know, if, whether seen by the north-south arm or the east-west arm, it will be bright enough to be seen by the other arm as well. But for bursts that are quite bright, more than about 20 sigma or so, we'll be able to detect them even if they happen to fall a bit outside of the primary beam of the, the complementary arm. So say the north-south arm was to detect an FRB down here a little bit outside the east-west arm's field of view, if it's bright enough, we'll still be able to, to, to find it and bring it back. So with this layout that we have now, the synthesized beam, um, the resolution of the, the images that we can make with Utmost 2D uh, is just under one arc minute. So it's just a little bit elliptical. And so the localization precision that we'll get back from that is of order one to five arc seconds. And that's do dominated by the systematics more so than the signal to noise. So a little bit earlier this year, we completed our full rollout um, of 66 cassettes deployed on the, on the north-south arm. And we now have the north-south um, uh, fan beam formation of those 192 beams, which I showed here running continuously, along with some, some other beams that we can uh, direct uh, steer more precisely that we use for pulsar timing. And I'll come to that later. Um, both, of the beam, uh, both, of, both of the arms run continuously a voltage buffer so that whenever we get a trigger, we can dump the, those voltages and, and image offline. Presently, the triggers are only coming from the east-west detector because at the moment we're retraining the detector system for the, for the north-south arm using data that's been taken from the north-south arm data. While we were deploying the, the hardware, we were training the uh, classification system using east-west arm data. And so now we're, we've got the real data from on the sky that we're using to train the north-south arm. Uh, and we can also set off uh, manual triggers if we want to, to observe a calibrator source. So, Together, the, the addition of the new north-south arm is expected to roughly double the event rate that we get out of the, the utmost facility to more like 10 FRBs per year, of which maybe 40% of them will be localizable to this arc second precision. So um, the two arms will be running con continuously and independently, forming their own tide beams and their own uh, fan beams to do pulsar timing and FRB searching uh, and we have independent correlators for the two of them so that they can be calibrated internally but then we also have to calibrate them against each other so that we can make a you know combined image with the the baselines between the north south and the east west stations um, to do that we cross correlate the the saved voltage data and this is just a an example from a little while ago now of a, of a um, about five seconds of data that we dumped on uh, one of our calibrator sources to show that we can actually get a fringe and the imaging of the correlated data sets that we'll be using to localize the FRBs is what's sort of being commissioned right now. Um, and we'd be one week further ahead if I hadn't been distracted by so many awesome talks at this uh, meeting so far. So I wanted to spend a bit of time now talking about the, um, the new detector system on the, on the north-south arm. And so this is work that's been done by my PhD student Ayushi, and she has a poster that you can all go and check out. I highly recommend. Um, and we live, in a, we live in a pretty hostile environment in, in Malongolo. We're not so far away from a major city. There's, a, there's roads that run past. And so we have a lot of 
radio, radio frequency interference that comes mostly from phone calls. And so what this is an example here, which is showing a single phone call in the Telstra band. Um, so it's about five megahertz wide, but there are several other phone call uh, transmission bands that are within our uh, in-band, uh, uh, sorry, our bound pass as well. And so when, when you get a few of these going off at once, they can create what looks like quite convincing um, uh, candidates if you look at just a single, a single beam. So this is actually, um, this is an RFI candidate, it's not an FRB. Um, you can see that it, the, the background is a little bit ratty and that might, uh, that might give you a little bit of pause if you didn't have anything else uh, to look at anyway. But the thing is we get something like 100,000 false positives like this per hour. Um, and not, not all of them quite as convincing as, as this, of course, but they, and they do tend to be clustered in time. And so that's quite bad for our real-time load balancing. So if you get too many things coming in at once, you can start to run out of space in your buffer and you would hate to have your buffer run out when a real FRB did arrive. So we're really looking to try and get around that. But fortunately, um, to combat our biggest enemy, we have our biggest ally, which is spatial information. So I'm just gonna show here the, the same set of data as taken from adjacent fan beams on the sky. So these are these long skinny beams next to each other. And if I move it forwards and backwards, you can see that the, the phone call is present firstly in all of the beams. And that's not something you would expect from something astrophysical, something coming in in a plane wave should be present at, in one or at most two beams if it's arriving in an overlap region. And also it tends to move, it seems to move a little bit in time. And that's a, a function again of the curved wavefront of the, of the local RFI source. And so we think, we thought we should be able to make use of this information. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by uh, feeding not just one beam's worth of time, frequency, power to, to a classifier uh, at one go, but multiple beams. And so if you have a, an astrophysical source like shown here, well, this is a, like a fake astrophysical source, but near enough, um, you expect to see it in uh, one or two beams, depending on where exactly where on the sky it lands. Whereas RFI, you will see in a lot of beams with some you know, uh, time dependence in the, in the structure. And so this is information that you don't, you don't normally have access to if you're looking at just a single pixel. Um, from uh, either, a, either a single pixel telescope or a beam in isolation from, a, from an interferometer. So what we've developed or what Aishi has developed is um, basically a two-stage convolutional neural network to, to, to take advantage of this spatial information. Um, and the way, we're, the way we've implemented it is to take the, the input data, which is 192 beams on the sky and then the time frequency, and chunk that up into blocks of three beams at a time and uh, 2000 time samples at a time and feed that into a direct classifier. So by this, I mean, there's no dispersion done first, no, no dispersion trials. Um, that, that classifier has been trained using um, uh, synthetic FRBs injected on the top of real, real noise to identify um, things that look like they might be FRBs. And so if you run the numbers, you see that there's about 100 blocks a second going in to this direct classifier. And what comes out is a, a only about one in every thousand does it say there's maybe something here. So about one block per minute. So then we take that, 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 sorry, Ben? Two minutes, sorry. Thank you. So then we take that, that one block that says that may have something of interest in it. We grab a bit more data. So we grab a couple of extra beams on either side. Uh, and we do our dispersion and boxcar averaging, so matching the, 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 the time scale of the FRB and thresholding. And we take the best couple of candidates we can find in that, in that one little block of time. And we feed it, we do the dispersion and then feed it to uh, a second convolutional neural network, which was uh, based on a very similar architecture to Fetch, um, that goes and looks to see, uh, is this really definitely an FRB or not? And the output of that we think is uh, lower than one false positive a day. So reducing the, the candidate rate by you know, about six or seven orders of magnitude. So this is a really neat system, I think, because it can be trained using injected FRBs. And what we've used so far is about 100,000 uh, synthetic FRBs and 100,000 control blocks. And we can stream that through basically continuously. So we can, we can keep retraining with new data uh, to take into account changing RFI or changing, changing, time, uh, uh, changing time properties of the, of the data. And the biggest problem we have at the moment, the biggest challenge we have, is that too few false positives leak through from the first stage to give us a good training step for the second stage. So what we've done so far is um, rather than taking only things that have failed the first stage, we take uh, candidates generated by a traditional 
dispersion and thresholding search like Heimdall. Um, and we see that uh, the second stage classifier also performs fabulously well on them. So it picks up every single last FRB and only lets through a couple of uh, false positives. But it would be naive to think that these two things are completely uncorrelated at the moment. And so what we need to be able to do is run our first stage classifier for a bit longer um, to generate enough, uh, you know, uh, tricky things to, to, to train the second stage classifier on. Um, I'm just about out of time. So uh, I'll also just say that um, in addition to the FRB program, we have a very active pulsar tying program at utmost. We can do about uh, 100 pulsars a day using you know, several tighter A beams at once. And that can all happen at the same time with, with the FRB search. And the, the tight array beams that we use to time pulsars, we can also point at other interesting sources like magnetars, repeating FRBs, whatever we would like to target for follow-up. So um, given that I am out of time, um, I'll just summarize by saying, we're now at the stage that we're running pulsars in the kind of routine mode that we'd like to. The trigger system is ready to accept triggers from the east-west arm and the north-south detector and trigger system is going to be turned on hopefully very, very soon. And the data is on disk to, uh, to do the tests of the correlation and imaging. Um, and like I said, I would be doing it right now if I wasn't giving this talk probably. But the most important thing is that I'd like to give a huge thanks to the team, both the, the individuals at site that have been working really, really hard to get the, uh, to get the hardware and uh, uh, software deployed and running there and uh, everyone at Swinburne that's been working on it as well. So thank you. Excellent, thanks very much, uh, Adam. Fascinating stuff. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one's from uh, Kalshtub who's asking, what is the typical false positive rate for your voltage trigger currently? Uh, which I think you sort of addressed uh, just, just now, but, uh, and also how big is the voltage buffer that you have? Yeah, right. So the, um, the false positive rate for the current system, so that's the east-west arm triggering system, uh, is a, a couple per day on average. Um, so, and that's using a completely separate classification system, which is based on uh, traditional, uh, you know, Heimdall-based uh, de-dispersion and thresholding, followed by a random forest classifier. So that's been published a couple of years ago in Farrer et al. Uh, and that's that's quite quite good. You know, it does. You know, it's cutting down many orders of magnitude, but still lets a lets a couple leak through. And in terms of the size of the buffer, um, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is in gigabytes, but it's about thirty seconds in time. Okay, that sounds great. Um, uh, so. There are people typing, but while people, oh no, here we go. We have another question from Sander. Uh, what is your strategy for FRB monitoring using the extra beams? Are you following up all parks FRBs? And do you have an agreement, yes. with, do you have an agreement with Meerkat? There you go. <laughs> um, no, we, so we, this is really just in its infancy now in that the, the Pulsar timing program, which is using the, those, those beams as well, um, is, has been our main way of validating um, the, the North-South arm system. And that's only really sort of settled down and, uh, and started to um, produce, uh, you know, routine data in the last couple of weeks. So we haven't really started the, the routine monitoring yet. Um, the, the most that we've done really is looking at, uh, at some of the magnetar sources. But so that's something that we, we want to get going in the next, uh, you know, the next months ahead. Excellent. Um got time for a couple more questions so there's an one from fabian how many fan beams do you form or plan to form in the north south system how many tracking tight array beams for pulsars and has the east west system been adjusted in terms of the number of beams three questions for the price of one okay yeah, exactly. what we're doing at the moment is 192 fan beams and that's just slightly over nyquist sampling the um the the set of um inputs that we're putting into the detector from the north south arm system so what we have on the north south arm is a, a contiguous block of about oh, 50 cassettes almost 50 then there's a small gap another block of six another small back another block of six and so it's those um approximately 60, in fact, it's exactly 60 cassettes total uh, being put together, but because of the couple of blocks, um, uh, sorry, sorry, a couple of gaps in the in between them, we need, uh, I think it's about 150-ish would Nyquist sample it, I think, and 192 is, is I think, just over Nyquist sampling it. Um, the number of tight array beams is three. Um, I think we could probably do a couple more if we wanted to, but that fits pretty comfortably within the GPU um, processing envelope. And the number of beams, fan beams on the east-west arm has 
gone up and down a couple of times. And I think we're actually using 352 again at the moment. So we, we kind of tried to push the envelope a little bit for a while to have a few more fan beams to, to overlap them a little bit more. But uh, we're running, uh, sailing a little bit too close to the wind in terms of the GPU capacity. And I think we turned it back to 352. Excellent. Um, we have time for one last question and then there is another set of questions in the, in the Slack that maybe you can address. Um, the last question is, um, from Srihar, she says, sorry if I missed this, but does the ABC classifier do the classification at a time sample by time sample level or a chunk by chunk level? Uh, and that's sort of related to a question I would have asked as well, because we have, um, we've done something similar, tried something similar to this and the, uh, the problem always is how do you deal with overlapping chunks and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, right. Chunk by chunk. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a chunk by chunk basis. So like I said, it's 2048 time samples at the moment. And so what you get out is a yay or nay on that there's, is there something in this 2048 by 512 channels by three beams? And if so, then you have to, then we go and grab some data centered on that time range, but adding a bit of extra time uh, and adding more beams, like I said, to, to go and try and zoom in on it. And the idea will be to overlap the, the chunks so that we have um, sensitivity to, you know, FRBs that would land half in one chunk and half in another. But we haven't actually done that yet because we've been trying to, uh, commission the simplest possible system first. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Adam. Yeah, um, thanks. So now we have uh, two recorded talks. Uh, the first of those recorded talks is by uh, Robert Wharton, who's going to talk about arc second localization of FRB 2020-11-24A with the UJMRT. Uh, and if there's any of the collaborators. Oh, I see there are some of the collaborators that are definitely online. So um, hopefully they can answer any questions that people have at the end of the talk. Okay, thanks, uh, Jason. Hi, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the arc second localization of FRB 2020-11-24A with the UGMRT. And I'm giving this on behalf of a larger collaboration of all the people listed there. And in true Olympic spirit, I have highlighted the graduate students in gold. Okay, so just a little background. So we're all on the same page. Um, the GMRT is an interferometric array a bit north of, uh, uh, located in, uh, in India. Um, it is comprised of 30 45 meter mesh dishes and it primarily targets low frequencies. Uh, and the baselines range from about 200 meters up to about 30 kilometers, um, which is really nice. Uh, the U in UGMRT means upgraded. Uh, that's because there was a major upgrade a couple years ago, which replaced a lot of the electronics and backends and stuff like that. And the main takeaway for us is that we can they can now pull down um, larger instantaneous bandwidth. So each of these bands can, uh, can get a couple hundred megahertz, which is really nice. Um, right. So I want to also talk about uh, two different observing modes that you can use for FRB or Pulsar, just sort of any time domain uh, science. So one is the phased array and one is the incoherent array. So the phased array is um, a mode in which you coherently combine the signals from all of the antennas. And in that sense, you get the most sensitivity, um, but your uh, field of view is very small. It's essentially the synthesized beam. So at 650 megahertz, this would be about four arc seconds. Uh, so you really need to know where your target is in order to use that. Um, your sensitivity is quite good. Um, at 650 megahertz, you'd get a fluence, a 10 sigma fluence uh, threshold of about half a Jansky millisecond, which is really nice. Um, the incoherent array uh, incoherently combines the signals from the antenna. So there's a square root of an antenna difference in the sensitivity between the two. Um, but one of the really nice things about that is that you get a much, much wider field of view because your beam size is essentially the primary beam size of a single antenna. So again, talking about 650 megahertz, your field of view would be about 42 arc minutes, which is really nice when you don't know where your source exactly is. And the, the sensitivity is still pretty good. Um, at 650 megahertz, your uh, 10 sigma fluence threshold would be about three Jansky milliseconds, which is not bad. 
Uh, the GMRT is also really great in that there's a lot, it's very flexible. There are lots of options for how you can observe these in terms of time and frequency setups, uh, polarization setups, you can do coherent dispersion, you can do subarrays with different observing frequencies in the different subarrays. Really cool stuff. You can even do some things that are uh, combined simultaneous. Um, the only real limitation is the data rate. Okay. Uh, so one of the nice things about the, the GMRT is that it, it, it meshes really well with, uh, with Chime. So if you want to do sort of follow-up or localization, it's really great. Um, so one thing you can do is just follow up Chime repeaters, particularly ones that have been localized. So you can use the full sen you can get the full sensitivity of the phased array beam. And one of the things that's nice about it, or well, there's a few things that are nice about it. One is that you can observe at the same frequencies that the FRBs were discovered with. Right, so the, the GMRT band 4 overlaps with the chime band, so that's nice. And you can, e you can also see pretty much any chime source because the, the GMRT can see anything above the deck of maybe minus 50 or so. Uh, you can also do a bunch of cool things with subarrays. Check out that lightning talk by Surya. Um, and just as an example, on the right are a bunch of bursts from FRB 2018-0916B. Um, that we did last year with the phased array, so very sensitive, some cool bursts. Check it out. Um, but I'm talking about localization here today, so I want to just sort of generally explain why uh, GMRT is really nice for localizing chime repeaters. Um, again, you get the similar uh, observing frequency, so you don't have to worry about shifting frequencies or what the rate would be. You also have a very wide field of view if you use the incoherent array, so it's something like 42 arc minutes which means that um, for sources that have been sort of localized by uh, CHIME through multiple detections, you can cover most of those uncertainty regions with just a pointing or two, which is really nice. So um, uh, in the, the work last year, what we did is we did, uh, we developed, a, I mean, developed, we, we, we implemented a strategy for, for localizing um, these FRBs with a source that had already been localized. But here's the strategy. Basically, you observe with the incoherent array um, because you can cover the wide field of view and you determine, you know, where the bursts are. Then um, you take uh, the visibilities at the highest uh, time resolution you can get, which in this case is about 0.6 seconds, and you make snapshot images uh, around each of those bursts. Um, so it's pretty, pretty straightforward and it seems to work pretty well. Um, so in general, here are sort of the, the pros and cons of this approach. Um, the pros, as I've said numerous times, are you're observing at the same frequency as the FRBs are discovered with Chime FRB. So that uh, really takes a lot of the guesswork out of, out of um, you know, is it active? What are the rates? Stuff like that. Um, you've got a wide field of view with the incoherent array, which gives you some latitude there. Um, the incoherent array sensitivity is actually comparable with Chime FRB. So again, it's one of those things where it's, you're taking a lot of the guesswork out of it because you can kind of just directly compare the results between the two. Um, it's imaging, so you get the uh, continuum imaging for free, so you can look for a persistent radio source. And there's also, like I said, lots of flexibility with the time and frequency resolution. What about the bad side? Well, uh, these aren't that bad. Um, the uh, one thing is that the, the correlator can only, the fastest it can do in terms of visibilities is 670 milliseconds. Ideally, we'd like, you know, 10 milliseconds or so, but uh, that's just not possible. Um, and then, of course, you want an active source so you have a chance of getting a burst. Uh, and then one thing that's uh, basically the result of our very young collaboration now is that we don't have a lot of the things in a streamlined pipeline. So, so these are uh, hand curated or handcrafted localizations. So they might take a, a couple days longer. Um, okay, so let's let's get at it. Um, let's let's uh, talk about uh, our campaign uh, for 2011-24A. So as uh, most of you know, uh, on 31st of March, Chime FRB put out an ATEL saying, hey, everybody, this source is super active and it's very bright. So um, it was a perfect target for us to, uh, to try out this localization. So we did. And uh, on the right, I've got a little bit of a timeline. So 31st of March is when the ATEL goes out saying, hey, check it out. 
Um, and then, so uh, the next day we submitted a DDT proposal to GMRT. And then two days after that, they were great this whole time in terms of getting things around quickly. Two days after that, they approved uh, the DDT. And uh, two days after that, so a few days after the original proposal, we were already on telescope. And that was over the weekend, so thank you very much to them. Um, so, right, so then we observe uh, with the GMRT a few days of moving data around and processing, and uh, we put out an ATEL on the persistent source, and then the next day we got the uh, localization. So nine days from learning about it, which I think is pretty good. Now, I mean, everybody knows this, I think, but just to say for sure, uh, we were not the first. We were in the medal round, but uh, not, not first. Um, ASCAP uh, got a localization out, uh, and so did VLA real fast uh, before, before we did. But I think it was pretty good, considering this is a, just a, a ragtag group here, you know. Um, let's see. Okay, so, right. So, so what, what did we actually do for the observations? Um, so we got three hours on source in band four, so 550 to 750 megahertz, and we recorded data in the incoherent array and also visibilities. Um, so on the right, you can see the 48 bursts that we detected in the incoherent array uh, with fluences that range from about three to 108 Jansky milliseconds. You can't see a ton here, but you know there's some bursts, a little bit of RFI, uh, not too bad. Here's a sort of random selection of kind of interesting looking bursts that we got. Um, but if you want to see the full details, we have a paper that should be on the archive, I think as I speak, but uh, I don't have the number <laughs> as I record this, but check that out. It should be cool. Um, okay, cool. So we, we detected 48 bursts that were bright enough in the incoherent array. So next step is, is imaging. So we took the TOAs and we went to the visibilities and we made six second snapshot images for all of the 48 bursts. And in those um, images for 34 of the bursts, we were able to actually make detections and get a position. So the figure here on the right shows a 10 by 10 arc second snippet of the total continuum image. So that blue source there is the persistent radio emission, which I'll talk about in a second. The yellow ellipses give the one sigma statistical uncertainty in RA and DEC for all of the 34 bursts. Um, and the white ellipse is the synthesized beam from the full um, observation. So, you know, just by looking at it, it's pretty good. Most of those bursts lie within the synthesized beam. So that's good. Um, again, these are just the statistical uncertainties. We still need to work out the systematic uncertainties and, and stuff like that. But one thing that you can do, in addition to having all of these bursts, you can just sort of make an image that contains all the time samples from all the bursts. So we did that, and um, you can get a position for that. And that's what this combined uh, point is. And for sort of make it a little cleaner, I'm just going to plot that from here on out. Um, so the other thing that you can see is that there's that persistent radio emission. So we can fit the centroid of that. Um, and there you go. So within the synthesized beam, and of course, for this particular source, we, we know the answer now because there was a VLBI localization of the bursts. So we're a little bit off and we need to figure out our uh, systematics there. But in terms of everything fitting within the synthesized beam, I think that's that's pretty good. Um, here's the ASCAP, uh, well, one of the ASCAP uh, localizations and the VLA one. And, uh, oh, and I've also plotted the uh, as a little symbol there, the SDS, there's an SDSS galaxy there. Um, let's see. Right. Um, so it turns out that the persistent emission is uh, just star formation from a galaxy. Um, but uh, we do have it, so that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, this green circle is just one arc second in radius, just to sort of uh, give a sense for maybe what our systematics might be. But that, that will, you know, you don't need to wait for the uh, our uh, publication that we're working on now uh, to get the final analysis there. Um, okay, right, so we, we did the localization, that's fun. Um, we also have tons of bursts, so you can do some science with those bursts. Um, so the, the burst on the left here is from the GMRT and the incoherent array beam. So we've cleaned it up through a little bit of filtering. And on the right is a, is a burst from Effelsberg at 1.4 gigahertz. So in both of these uh, observations, we got a ton of bursts, 
So you can do a lot of very cool stuff. Um, so Henning talked about this in the plenary session, um, in his plenary session talk, and there's a publication coming out uh, shortly. It should be on the archive today as well. Um, and basically we do a real, lot of really cool stuff with this in terms of um, measuring the scintill scintillation bandwidths, the scintillation time scales, scintillation velocities. I think there's even a secondary spectrum in there, so check that out. Cool stuff. Okay, so just sort of a, a summary of, of what we did here. Um, well, in, in our three-hour observation with the GMRT, we detected 48 bursts from FRB 2020-11-24A. Of those 48, we were able to image 34 of them for localization. Uh, we found a radio source coincident with the bursts. Uh, subsequent VLBI observations showed that this was resolved, so it's due to just star, formain, st star formation. Um, and the localization happened, uh, our localization happened about nine days after the Chime uh, ATEL alert, which I think is pretty good. Um, we have two papers coming out uh, shortly on the burst properties, so fluence, DM, widths, drift rates, anything you could want, and also stuff about the scintillation bandwidth and time scale and sort of understanding the um, scattering screen geometry. And then, of course, the localization one will come out uh, a bit later. Um, right. So this is kind of, um, I think, this hopefully the start of um, a productive uh, collaboration uh, working with uh, the GMRT to, to do FRB science. Um, we have some other stuff that's ongoing and that we want to do in the future. Um, so ongoing, we have a project to study uh, using the phased array to study 2018-09-16b, sort of doing uh, multi-frequency uh, polarimetry over the course of, oh, I called it an orbit, but, you know, the cycle, the activity cycle. So see the lightning talk by Surya, the plenary talk by Dungza, and um, we're also following up 2020-11-24a, and hopefully we'll get an annual variation of scintillation, which is kind of cool. And of course, we want to continue doing localization of new repeaters. Um, we're hopefully working with um, uh, Chime FRB collaboration, and we have a, a, a target of opportunity um, project sub proposal submitted to the GMRT, wherein we would target sources that already have baseband localization um, from Chime FRB, and then we would uh, trigger uh, on a burst detection. So we've got a couple things that we can do to improve our efficiency, and hopefully that will be sort of a very uh, nice way of getting getting localizations. I also spent some time making this pretty sharp logo on the right. Um, so yeah, I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you especially to everyone at the GMRT who made this work uh, possible and for the quick turnaround and, uh, and all of the help on that end. And thank you to you for listening. And if you have any questions, hopefully someone here is to answer. Otherwise, put it in the Slack and I will answer it at when I wake up. Bye. Thanks. Okay, thanks to, to Robert for that really very interesting talk. Um, apart from questions and comments about the logo, um, is there any, uh, are there any questions? There are a few people from this collaboration uh, around, so um, if there are any questions, then certainly put them to them. Just trying to check in all the different locations. <laughs> Maybe I can ask one verbally then? Uh -huh, of course, go for it. Yes, I was intrigued about the, the scintillation measurements. What was the Im implied velocity of the, the screen in those measurements? Or was it just dominated by the Earth's orbital motion? So I think, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to check if Robert Main is on. I don't see him in this list. But maybe somebody else uh, from the collaboration might like to raise their hand if, oh, Laura can answer, okay. Uh, should be able to answer now, Laura. Uh, okay, yeah, it looks like I'm unmuted. Um, uh, yeah, it was dominated by the Earth's motion. Um, but yeah, it's, it's much lower than the, so it's in Henny's talk, it's also in, in Robert's paper. Sort of reserve 10 kilometers a second. 
So what? So what is the goal? So imagine you can observe this this FRB throughout the throughout the year for a few years or so. Um, yep. What 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 does that enable? That allows you to measure the location of the scattering screen. Okay. Yep. The 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 distance uh, in the Milky Way. Correct. Yeah. So it's all nicely laid out in, in Robert Main's paper, which is on AstroPH now. So. So there's no evidence, Laura, for for any any scattering um, from anything other than the the Milky Way ISM, where you can that's kind of that model fits the data quite well. The, uh, the, the, the observed scattering is lower than what you'd expect actually from uh, the NE2001 model. Um, I think is, is what I'm is, is answering your question um, by quite a bit. Uh, and so in that actually that paper, we speculate that um, it's dominated by a different, so in, in, the, in that line of sight, according to the NE2001 model, it should be dominated by one of the spiral arms about two kiloparsecs away. But if instead it's dominated by a more local material than the scattering, uh, the observed scattering and slash scintillation bandwidth, um, specifically we're measuring scintillation bandwidth, um, uh, it's, it would be consistent with the more local local scattering screen. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Laura. Um, we will. Um, We'll now move on to the next uh, recorded talk. Uh, and this is by uh, one minute better, harder, sorry, um, who will talk about Chime FRB outriggers and chords, new instruments for localization of fast radio bursts. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this talk. My name is Juan Menaparra. I am a Kavli Fellow at MIT, and today I will talk to you about Chime FRB outriggers and Chord, which are two new instruments for localization of FRBs. Through FRB 2021, we have had the opportunity to see how Chime has emerged as the leading facility for detecting FRBs. Since the start of operations in 2018, the instrument has detected thousands of events. And one of the most important outcomes of the project has been the release of the first Chime FRB catalog with more than 500 FRBs, including multiple events from repeating sources. Um, here I'm just showing a few examples of the type of analysis that have been enabled by such a large sample of events collected with a single well-known instrument. Um, um, some of this we have seen during the, the FRB 2021 plenary sessions. Uh, do not miss uh, Masood's presentation and cross-correlations with the large scale structure. Uh, some other analysis have been published on papers already, and some uh, papers are coming soon, so stay tuned. However, at this point, you probably realize that one of the most important limitations for CHIME for FRB science is localization. Remember that, as its name suggests, CHIME's compact array design and cylindrical structure was driven by cosmology goals. And it was during its construction that we realized that it, this could also be an excellent instrument to study the radio transient sky, so we upgraded the back end to perform pulsar timing and FRB science. Chime works as an interferometer with maximum baselines of about 100 meters. So it typically provides our minute localization, which can be sufficient to localize a low DM FRB, as we already saw in Mohit's presentation in plenary one. But in general, it's not enough to tell which galaxy it came from, let alone which region within a galaxy. If we want to be able to tell the FRB host galaxy, we need the arc second localization precision, which for an interferometer working at the chime frequencies requires baselines of hundreds of kilometers. And if additionally, we want to be able to tell the region within a galaxy, we would need baselines of thousands of kilometers, which means that we will need VLBI with continental baselines. To overcome this limitation, the chime FRB collaboration is currently developing chime FRB figures which is a program to deploy cylindrical outrigger telescopes at continental baseline distances. CHIME and the outriggers will form a dedicated VLBI network with the sensitivity to detect hundreds of FRBs each year with the 50 milliard second localization precision in near real time, allowing us to identify host galaxies and FRB environments within the host. If we knew when and where the next uh, FRB event was going to occur, 
all we need to do with a telescope like Chime is digitally point it to that location at the right time and record the data. And that means that instead of processing and saving all the data from individual antennas, we will need to save data from combinations of antennas, making the data volume much more manageable. The challenge with FRB VLBI is that we do not know when or where the next FRB event is going to occur. And that means that we need to process massive data rates in real time in order to detect and localize these events in blind searches with wide fields of view. As an example, the internal data rate of the Chime correlator is 6.6 .6 terabits per second. And that of a null rigger is gonna be about one terabit per second. We cannot save those uh, data rates continuously. So our solution is to adopt a triggered approach where data is buffered in memory and we only store it on disk upon the receipt of a trigger from the Chime FRB real time search pipeline. Let's check this diagram to see how that works. At Chime, the correlator digitizes the voltages that encode the electric field received from each antenna, then separates each signal into narrow frequency channels to form what we call baseband data. These data are used to form static intensity beams that are fed to the Chime FRB backend to search for highly dispersed transients in real time. The correlator also has a ring buffer that allows it to keep about 40 seconds of baseband in memory. And when Chime FRB detects an FRB candidate, it generates a trigger signal that makes the correlator save its buffered baseband data to disk. The outrigger stations will also buffer their local baseband data continuously. And when Chime FRB registers an FRB trigger, the outriggers will receive a signal to dump their buffer data to disk. Then the local data of each station is transmitted to a central facility where the signals are correlated together. And in this way, the outriggers operate with Chime as an interferometer with the angular resolution of a telescope with an aperture of thousands of kilometers. The Chime FRB team at MIT includes Professor Kiyoshi Masui, grad student Calvin Leung and me. And together we led the effort to demonstrate the feasibility of triggered FRB VLBI using Chime FRB outriggers. For that, we used the Chime Pathfinder, which is a small scale prototype of Chime with identical design and field of view. And it has the same collecting area of the outriggers under construction. The Pathfinder is located 400 meters from Chime and was constructed before the main telescope as a testbed for technology development. We recovered the Pathfinder and upgraded its backend to operate as an outrigger. So now the telescope is equipped with a custom wideband recorder programmed to save its local baseband data when it receives a trigger from Chime FRB. The waterfall plot on the right is an example of an FRB detected interferometrically between Chime and the Pathfinder operating as independent telescopes. And this work demonstrates not only the triggering and recording system, but also wide field calibration techniques that we are now using with the new VLBI outriggers. Another important challenge for Chime FRB outriggers is calibration. The main problem being that it is very hard to find steady radio sources that correlate on continental baselines at Chime frequencies. For example, a standard VLBI calibrator that is unresolved at high frequencies could be an extended source in the Chime band. Things complicate even more for stationary telescopes like Chime that cannot slew towards a calibrator. It can only observe the source when it transits to the field of view. Our strategy is to use pulsars to calibrate the outriggers. And the advantage of pulsars is that they are compact. They can be separated from the steady radio background from their pulses and they are sufficiently abundant to be used as the primary sources for phase calibration. The top plot shows a Cartesian projection of the grid of bright pulsars that we plan to use for calibration. And a team led by Jane Kaxmarek from the RAO and Alice Courtney from Miguel is working to localize these pulsars with milliard second precision using the VLBA. At the same time, the MIT team is developing a timing system that will keep the outrigger synchronized between calibrations using high performance atomic clocks. And what this means is that we will be able to calibrate the array in any of the gray regions of the top plot, but the array will stay synced even in the white regions of the plot, such that if an FRB event occurs there, we will still be able to face reference set to a pulsar. Recently, a team led by Professor Keith Vanderland and grad student Tomas Casanelli from University of Toronto upgraded the 10-meter telescope at the Algonquin Radio Observatory in Ontario, Canada. So now this telescope can be operated as an outrigger at a baseline distance of about 3,000 kilometers. And they use this telescope to perform trigger VLBI observations of the Krab pulsar between Chime and ARO. 
demonstrating the feasibility of pulsars as calibrators for chime for beta riggers and extending the calibration techniques that we developed with the Pathfinder to correct for ionospheric effects. As for the status of the project, the uh, rigger at Allenby at about 100 kilometers from Chime is already under construction, both the uh, structure and the analog and digital installation. And we expect to see first light with this uh, rigger by the end of the year or early 2022. The second uh, rigger will be located at the Green Bank Observatory at a baseline of more than 3000 kilometers and construction there also started recently. As for the third side, both the location and the specifications are under discussion and we also expect to start the construction by the end of the year. Chime for Beha Riggers represents the first phase of CORD, the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector. This will be a next generation radio telescope that will complement Chime and the cylindrical riggers with large arrays of dishes instrumented with ultra wideband feeds and receivers operating in the 0.3 to 1.5 gigahertz band. It will consist of a core array with 512 six meter dishes and outriggers with 64 six meter dishes. Core will have three times the bandwidth of chime, almost two times its collecting area and have its system temperature. All this translates to an instrument that will be an order magnitude more powerful than chime. For FRB science, it will use the same triggered approach from Chime FRB riggers, and of course, all the methods and techniques that we are developing for the first phase will be applied on court. There are several critical technologies that together enable an instrument like court. One is the use of composite material technology to mass produce reflectors that achieve submillimeter surface accuracy at a moderate cost. These dishes are lighter, can be fabricated in one piece, so they are more repeatable and less prone to surface errors. What this means is that we will have an instrument that is easier to understand and calibrate compared to, for example, Chime, which due to its design has a beam that is difficult to characterize. The team at the University of Toronto is currently developing an ultra wide bandwidth feed that can be mass produced with high precision at a moderate cost. So the photos that I'm showing here are from a dual polarization prototype produced from laser cut sheet of metal. Um, this initial prototype was designed to operate in the 0.4 to 2 gigahertz band, but uh, a similar performance is achieved when we move to the core band. And uh, as you can see from the impedance matching plot, the, the measurements are consistent with our simulations and they, they exceed the, the specification. And last but not least, Professor Leonid Belostotsky and grad student Mark Lay from University of Calgary are leading the development of a room temperature low noise amplifier that can achieve better than 20 Kelvin noise temperature over the core band, which is crucial to achieve the better than 30 Kelvin system temperature specification. So here I'm showing you an example of the expected noise performance of the LNA when matched to the impedance of the ultra wideband feed. And uh, recent measurements agree well with this simulation. We are currently building a testbed instrument at DRIO to integrate all the systems and evaluate their performance. Um, this is work led by the McGill and DRIO teams, including postdoc Dallas Wolf and grad student Denise Olchek. The instrument is called D3A6 and it will consist of three six meter dishes instrumented with the prototype feed and the wideband receivers. It will have east-west baselines of six, 32 and 39 meters and is scheduled to see first light by the end of the year. The approximate timeline for CORD is that we are currently commissioning Chime FRB riggers and developing the enabling technologies for CORD. And the construction of the CORD array will start next year, uh, that of the riggers in 2023. And we expect to complete commissioning and start operations by 2025. So this is it for this talk. I will leave you with the summary. Chime has emerged as the leading facility for detecting FRBs. Chime FRB riggers will extend uh, Chime capabilities to include VLBI, so it will not only detect but also localize hundreds of FRBs each year with 50 milli arc second precision. And Chime FRB riggers represents the first phase of CORD, which is a next generation ultra wideband instrument that will significantly improve Chime's angular resolution and sensitivity for FRB science. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Juan. Uh, I see from the chat that you are actually around. Um, 
perhaps if you'd be uh, happy to answer questions, um, I can um, allow you to speak. Um, okay, so there have been uh, some questions flying by in the chat, um, but perhaps it would be helpful for others if, um, if you can answer them out loud. And we have some time. So um, uh, sure. Jason was asking about the LOFA long baseline calibrator catalog and whether that could be useful. Great. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to reply there that, um, yeah, the, the, the um, so LOFAR has done like a, a great job uh, uh, like uh, uh, finding this uh, steady calibrators that we could use uh, at, at low uh, frequencies. And, um, and uh, I, I would say like the, at least in the initial stages of, of uh, China have been rigorous or plans to use uh, Pulsars, just because again, they're, they're abundant, and 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 we have already uh, shown, demonstrated that we can use them uh, for phase referencing. Um, uh, I will mention that uh, with the ARO chime uh, baseline, so the the ARO telescope uh, that was mentioned in the talk, um, first attempt to to observe this uh, steady calibrators, we 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 couldn't successfully calibrate the array, so. Yeah, the, the pulsar approach is more like the, the conservative approach that that we planned to do at the beginning. But yes, the the, the um, calibrators, uh, uh, steady calibrators like the one provided by by the by Lofar will be will be very useful. Juan, can I can I just ask a quick follow up about that? But in terms of like bright-ish pulsars in the nor northern hemisphere, you, you probably only have like one per hundred square degrees, though, right? So wouldn't the calibrators be in most cases, many degrees away from the FRB that you're trying to calibrate. Right. So that'll be. Um, uh, well, I guess I kind of go back to and show the slides. That'll be like the, the the map that is shown in 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 one of the slides when we show uh, in a, a Cartesian projection of uh, of the um, um, pulsars, the grid of pulsars that we uh, uh, expect to to see. And yeah, as you see there, uh, this. Uh, Basically, the gray regions there are, are the regions where we can have an access to a pulsar to calibrate, and and uh, there'll be like let's say that uh, there are going to be regions there like let's say between 200 to 220 ish uh, uh, degrees where we might not have access to a, a pulsar that is uh, bright enough for to, to calibrate. Um, um, the, the idea there is that we're going to have a system that can still maintain coherence during that time and we can phase reference. Of course, if we can find a, a steady calibrator uh, in that region, we'll, we, will, we will use it. Uh, but again, it's like the, the, the most uh, conservative uh, approach. Maybe, maybe I'll ask this further offline, but I don't quite understand. Uh, it seems like you're implying that you can calibrate along these RA strips regardless of the declination of the FRB. Which doesn't seem obvious to me, but maybe we can discuss that offline. Sure. sure. Um, Adam, you had a comment. Did you want to follow up on that, or no? That was just also related to that to that point. Okay, and I think it's been covered. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Sheree had a question about um, what material do you use for the Vivaldi prototypes? Um, I think this is the, um, just a laser cut uh, sheet of uh, aluminum. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't have the, the exact details about the, 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 the material for the for the. Okay, and there are, um, there's a double, double question, I guess, about the same thing. Um, is the, both Ronikas and Sandra Tavain are asking, uh, what about the ionosphere? Right. So um, at this uh, uh, definitely uh, the ionosphere is the is, uh, the, the main source of uh, instability or what's gonna uh, uh, affect us uh, more uh, at, at time frequency. So basically, those uh, the the localization uh, specification that we that we have for uh, time for rigors is is uh, I mean it's not as much by the uh, statistical error, but more by like uh, systematic errors. And most of those systematic errors are gonna come from uh, the ionosphere. Um, we are going to, um, uh, I mean, the fact that we uh, have a, 
uh, a wide bandwidth uh, helped us like mitigate that effect uh, because well, ionosphere shows up differently as a, as a true delay, but but it still is like the, the main uh, uh, source of uh, uncertainty in in our localization. So those uh, that 15 yards to current uh, spec it already includes like the effect of the of the ionosphere. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, given that we've just ticked over to eleven o'clock. Um, I think we can uh, draw this session to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers again for uh, a seriously very interesting session and for sticking to uh, to time. And um, I would uh, greatly encourage you to come to, I guess, actually, sorry, Clint, I guess we're going back to 7B, right? This is the next one this afternoon. That's right, but there's coffee before in Gathertown as well. Right, starting right now, actually. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much.